It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Deputy Premier. Deputy, uh, in November of 2008, the Ministry of Health received a letter from a whistleblower who had worked at Orange. <clears throat> in his letter of April 2008, Keith Walmsley said that there were two sets of accounting books. One was used for internal reporting, and the other was used for quarterly reporting to the ministry, all with a view to hiding the surplus of money Orange had received from the ministry. So, Deputy Premier, were you briefed on the problems at Orange raised by this whistleblower when you first became Minister of Health in October 2009? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and I will. Um, I know the Minister of Health would like to speak uh, about further progress at Orange. As the member opposite knows, we have had years now of discussion about Orange. The committee has met. There has been uh, great debate in this House. The fact is, Speaker, that we've moved on at Orange. We have new leadership. When I became aware of the problems at Orange, I worked closely with the Auditor General, Speaker, to ensure that he had the information he needed as he did his audit. Uh, we uh, brought in a completely new board, new leadership, uh, new uh, quality improvement plans. Speaker, the answer is we, the Orange is a far, far better organization now than it was answer. when I became minister. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the uh, Deputy Premier. <clears throat> Speaker, I can, uh, from my experience, having held a number of cabinet positions, the minister would have been fully briefed uh, by ministry officials on the top issues and concerns when she first takes office, and that was October of 2009. So may I say to you, Deputy, it's beyond believable that you would not have been briefed on the serious allegations raised by the whistleblower's letter. In addition to alleging the shady accounting practices at Orange, Mr. Walmsley says, and I quote, individuals are also benefiting far too luxuriously. For example, the president's bonus of $250,000, end of quote. Deputy Premier, how can you continue to stand up every day and insist you knew nothing about the question of Orange at Orange until December of 2011. Uh, Speaker, I, uh, I was called to committee. I testified on three different occasions. I would be happy to send you the transcripts from that if you would like. I stand my, by my testimony at that committee. What I can tell you, Speaker. Order. Thank you. Uh, speaker, what I can tell you is that in response to concerns at Orange, it was almost three years ago that I introduced legislation in this House to remedy things at Orange. That bill has been uh, debated an astounding 23 different days in the Legislature. It was sent to committee in uh, April 2013. The member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. But both the opposition parties ganged up to Answer. refuse hearings on that issue. Uh, Speaker, it's time to vote for Bill 8 Thank and get you. this matter behind us. The member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. Supplementary, uh, final supplementary. Well, again, uh, Deputy, uh, Mr. Speaker, the consequences of uh, the Deputy Premier's failure to act could not have been more serious for Ontarians. The committee learned that between October 2009, when the Deputy Premier became the Minister of Health, and December 2011, when she says she was first, became, when she first be, says she first became aware of the problems at Orange, there were at least two serious incidents that are now subject of multi-million dollar lawsuits against this government. In May 2010, a patient had to undergo an amputation as a result of a delay in transport. In July 2010, a patient from the Sioux area died as a result of a delay in transport. Deputy Premier, patients have died because you sat back for two years as Minister of Health and did nothing about Orange. Deadly. Question. How could you not feel the moral obligation to do the right thing and step down? Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, I and my colleagues on this side of the House are 
proud of the work that the Deputy Premier, when she was Minister of Health, did to turn Orange around to make the necessary changes to restore the public's confidence in this important organization. And, and Mr. Speaker, not only the former minister, now the Deputy Premier, but we continue to make important changes. She's mentioned we have new leadership, a new CEO, a new board, a new chair. This Deputy Premier introduced changes, uh, including a new performance agreement, conflict of interest guidelines, a patient advocate, many Order. changes, and there are changes still required. That's why we speak Answer. to the importance of getting the opposition support to pass Bill 8 to make those further changes and complete the transition. Mr. Thank you. Yep. New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, my question is for the uh, Premier, Mr. Speaker. Premier, a total of 86 Ontario municipalities have now declared that they are not willing hosts for the continued spread of green energy projects. Uh, these include the four municipalities that surround WPD's application to build eight 500 foot, sorry, the Premier's not here. Deputy, Deputy Premier, uh, to build eight 500-foot tall wind turbines on the flight path to the Collingwood Regional Airport. Uh, I say to the Deputy Premier, this is the very same project that the Premier committed to the weekend before she became Liberal leader when she held a press conference in Collingwood. And at that time, she said she would personally review that project. So I say to you, when all four municipalities are against this development in my riding, because at that same press conference, the Premier said that if the municipalities are against it, they shouldn't have these projects. Question. Them. Is your government still going ahead with this dangerous proposal to build 500-foot tall wind turbines on the flight path of the Collingwood Airport? I'll I'll stop. Um, I recognize that may have been a slip, but I uh, do want to remind all members, I take it as an opportunity, not a criticism, to remind everybody we do not talk about anyone's attendance in this place. Uh, excuse me. Minister, uh, I've already explained my circumstance. I don't need editorials. And I did say to the, to the, uh, to, that I believed it was a, a slip, so I wanted to leave it at that. Teachable moment. Uh, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. Deputy Premier. To Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, um, we have looked at the procurement uh, process for renewables, uh, and we have a new regimen in place, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there, in fact, is a very current uh, procurement going on at the present time. Uh, for renewable project, large renewable projects, Mr. Speaker, uh, which require and will require a very significant municipal participation. On the other hand, Mr. Uh, uh, I'm not going to let it build, so stop. <coughs> Carry on. On the other hand, Mr. Speaker, there are a number of existing contracts which are out there, which we will not break. Uh, because we will have the type of, uh, type of liabilities uh, which occurred, as they know, uh, with uh, several of our other energy projects uh, at very significant yes, costs. There are communities who are asking us to uh, break contracts, lar large renewable projects. There are some who are asking us, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. to extend the uh, contract. Thank you. Supplementary, the member from dufferin Caledon. About old projects, Minister, these are new problems. Placement of industrial wind turbines and the related transmission lines are causing problems all across Ontario. When you allowed the Green Energy Act to strip municipalities of their planning power, you also left those same municipalities to clean up your mess. This summer, Dufferin Wind Power has been installing a transmission line for its wind farm in Dufferin County. This summer, now. In Melanchthon, there are some transmission poles that are so close to the road, the mayor has told me they're not going to be able to safely plow that road. The municipality Speaker. knew this would be a problem, raised it during the consultation in the spring, raised it with the premier and your ministers through numerous letters, and you still allowed the company to ignore their concerns. Absolutely shameful. Is this your idea of your new consultation process? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. That party continues to ask us to break existing contracts. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, what they did. Come to order.
clock is still running. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, the PC plan was to cancel existing contracts. They introduced legislation which would give the Minister of Energy the right to cancel existing contracts. Our calculations, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, would show that that would expose the provincial government to liability to the extent of about $20 billion wow. to cancel power purchase contracts. Wow. Wow. They continually have risen in this House to ask us to break existing yes, contracts and expose the province to billions of dollars in penalties. The uh, member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. The member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, who's not in his seat, will come to order. Finished. Final supplementary. This is about public safety, here, and here. that is your job. Speaker, I'd like a page to bring you a, bring the minister a picture, so that you just you start to understand how close these utility poles are to the existing roadway. If these poles aren't relocated, Melanchthon may be forced to redesign. Thank you, redesign the road to ensure safety and allow winter maintenance. The Minister of Energy or the Minister of Transportation could direct these transmission lines be moved so that Melanchthon residents are not forced to pay the additional cost of redesigning the road. Will you do it? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the member knows that there is an environmental process. The member from Huron Bruce will come to order. The member from uh, Simcoe North will come to order. Uh, and some are getting close to warnings. Carry on. The member from Renfrew and Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Two. Mr. Speaker, um, I have a quote here from uh, the member from uh, Nipissing uh, when he was mayor, uh, the MPP from Nipissing. Taking advantage of locally available green power resources is a good fit with the long-range development strategy we have for the community. I am particularly pleased with the relationship we have struck with wind, West Wind Development for the first half of the project. I am confident that the company's reputation as a responsible wind power developer can put North Bay on the map as a showcase for the sensitive and responsible development of this great renewable energy project. Mr. Speaker, they continually stand up and challenge us to cancel existing contracts, which will expose the province to $20 billion. There is a process for environmental assessment. There I, uh, I stand, you sit. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. I want to ask the Deputy Premier an extremely important question, Speaker. It's a question that matters to Ontarians in every corner of this province. How many people will this government fire as part of the Liberal austerity budget? Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, um, I can uh, assure the member, the leader of the third party, that our government is determined to get to balance by 2017-18, but we will not do it at the expense of our growing economy. So we have a plan in place that will get us to balance. I have been appointed as president of the Treasury Board. With a strong Treasury Board, uh, we are looking very closely at how we can get better value for the money that we spend, that we can provide better services to the people of this province. Speaker, the status quo is not an option. We must get to work and get the best value possible for every tax dollars. So uh, I, I look forward to working with the, the, uh, the NDP speaker because I think they may even have some good ideas on how to continue to get better value for our, our harder dollars. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the Liberal austerity budget will cut 6 per cent from most ministries each and every year. Don Drummond looked at the Liberal budget and he said that would mean 100,000 job cuts. The people of Ontario soundly rejected the Conservative plan to cut 100,000 jobs. Why are the Liberals now picking up the same plan and firing 100,000 people? Well, Speaker, I think anybody uh, watching at home might need a little reminder that, in fact, the NDP built their platform, all nine pages of it, including the cover and the back cover, Speaker, nine, their nine-page platform used our assumptions, and then they said we can actually go further. 
we can find an additional $600 million worth of cuts, Speaker. So I find it a, a, a puzzling a little bit that the, the third party would be, would be concerned about cuts when they actually promised to cut further. And the member from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come so to order. Let's just take a look at how we are doing in this province as our economy continues to improve. Uh, since uh, 2009, the recessionary low speaker, we've added over half a million jobs. Our unemployment rate, Speaker, is down. Our Answer. job numbers are up, Speaker. Last year, uh, Ontario employment increased by 100,000 jobs. Thank you. We're on the right track, and we will stay. Thank you. Well, Speaker, a thousand uh, jobs not coming to Windsor with the Ford plant. Windsor's uh, transmission plant closed. Oshawa's truck Minister plant. Minister of Agriculture, come to order. Ford St. Thomas plant closed. St. Catherine's components plant. Navistar. Uh, in Chatham, the list goes on and on, Speaker. But the fact is, Bloomberg News said that the Liberal budget means the deepest cut since Mike Harris. You know, the Premier used to say that she actually got into politics because of Mike Harris. Now, we used to think that was to oppose him, not to imitate him. Now she's going to go even further than as far as Mike Harris went. The Premier called the PC plan to fire 100,000 people disastrous, but she's going to tint 100,000 pink slips with Liberal red instead of Tory blue and insists that that's a progressive plan, Speaker. Now, do the Question. Liberals think it's progressive to fire 100,000 people? Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, uh, I'm sure the, the leader of the third party will be very pleased to join us in celebrating a very significant investment that is happening today in Alliston. Uh, speaker, I'm very pleased that, uh, that uh, Honda is making the Alliston facility the global lead for the very popular Honda Civic. That is very, very good news for Ontario. These investments, it is almost a billion dollars investment, Speaker, will safeguard 4,000 highly skilled direct positions and help thousands more who are in that supply chain. So, Speaker, Honda's investment $857 million over the next five years in the latest assembly and engine manufacturing technology. Thank you. This is fantastic news and a sign of the New question, the leader of the third party. Well, Speaker, if you keep uh, jobs at Honda and still fire 100,000 people, that's 100,000 people that are still unemployed, Speaker. Uh, but the bottom line is, my next question is also for the Deputy Premier. You know, last week, Speaker, 15 nurses in Leamington learned that they'd lose their jobs when the hospital decides uh, they'd be cutting obstetrics and gynecology unit out of the hospital. Not only will that put nurses out of work, Speaker, it is going to make it extremely difficult for women in this part of the Southwest to ac access OB-GYN services close to home. What other health services in Ontario, Speaker, are being cut as part of the Liberal austerity budget? Uh, to the uh, Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to speak about uh, Leamington Hospital and the decision that was taken by the board of the hospital to, uh, on a, a go-forward basis, to close the obstetrical unit. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it isn't a final decision because, in fact, it's a decision by the Lynn, the local Lynn, and, uh, in fact, the Lynn next Wednesday uh, has announced already that they'll be having a community meeting. They're going to have an open board meeting of the Lynn uh, specifically on this issue, Mr. Speaker, including one hour set aside specifically from the Hamilton the Mountain community come to, to order. speak to this important issue. So, although in fact it was a decision by the local board of the hospital, it isn't a decision which is finalized. And I should add as well that currently uh, Windsor Regional Hospital is a already roughly 50% of the women who do deliver, who are from the Leamington area, do deliver already in Windsor. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, two weeks ago, 40 nurses at the Timmins and District Hospital found out they would be losing their jobs, and 26 beds will disappear. So I repeat the question, what other health services in Ontario are being cut as part of the Liberal austerity budget? Minister of Health, long-term care. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I know that from time to time specific changes are made by hospitals in terms of their staffing requirements, but the fact is, Mr. Speaker, that in last year alone, 4,000 more nurses yeah. were employed in this yeah. province. In fact, 24,000 more nurses are working in Ontario since our party, the Liberal Party, took power in 2003. So I understand that the member opposite, the leader of the third party, wants to focus on specific incidents where human resource uh, decisions are made by, frankly, Mr. Speaker, where those decisions should be made at the locality, by the hospital, in concert with the local LIN as well. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that we're deeply committed to nursing and the profession in this province, and the evidence is we've dramatically increased not only our investments in that profession, the increase in scope of practice, the nurse practitioner-led clinics, but also 4,000 new nurses you. last year alone. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, when it comes to uh, liberal austerity cuts, the health care system is not the only victim. People for Education has reported that the Liberals have slated 125 schools for closure before 2015. That means throwing parents and students into chaos across Ontario. So can the Deputy Premier tell students and their families just what communities will be losing their local schools as part of the Liberal Austerity Plan? Minister. Uh, to the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much. And I'm always fascinated uh, when I get these numbers that pop up out of nowhere. So I can guarantee you that uh, there has been no directive, so I have no answer to what's 125 schools because there is no list. But what I can tell you is that we do know that there are over 600 schools in Ontario which are more than half empty. We are actually spending on the order of about $1 billion per year on empty seats. We actually think on our side of the House that it would be better. That's a very good idea. We will change the funding formula. We actually think on our side of the House that we should invest money in the children who are in our Answer. schools rather than an empty seat. Thank, thank you. you. New question. Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is to the Minister of Finance. Minister, last week when our tourism critic asked for the economic analysis supporting the punitive aviation fuel tax you've placed on Ontario families, you avoided the question. So, Minister, let me help you with the math. We told you about the loss of 3,000 jobs and $100 million in GDP predicted by Dr. Fred Lazar of York University, University's Schulich School of Business. Dr. Lazar also told us that eliminating the tax, as in BC, New Brunswick, Quebec, and Saskatchewan, could provide an $138 million economic boost, add 52,000 additional tourists, and close to 2,000 jobs. But we're going in the wrong direction. In fact, we're the only jurisdiction heading in the opposite direction. So tell us, Minister, what is the secret? What economic analysis have you done on Question. the impact of job and revenue losses that this aviation tax will cause? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, uh, since we announced the, uh, the aviation fuel modest increase of a penny, Air Canada has launched new flights from Toronto to Rio de Janeiro, Amsterdam, and Pan Am. Wow. Uh -huh. You should also note that in comparison to some other jurisdictions, and I believe they've named, they've named Buffalo as one, Buffalo. there's 68,000 flights in Buffalo. In Pearson, in Toronto, there's 420,000 flights. There's seven airlines in Buffalo. There's over 65 airlines Buffalo. in Toronto and Pearson. They only serve 22 cities, Ontario, and in Pearson, they serve over 180 destinations worldwide. And the analysis that he makes, they're comparing 5 million travelers in Buffalo. In Pearson, it's over 36 million in 2013 alone. You should also note, Mr. Speaker, that when they talk about the increase, which hasn't been touched since 1992, and it's a penny, they're asking the wrong level of government. If they're going to petition anybody, they should let it be known where the real Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, as I had mentioned, uh, every other province in Canada who is going in the opposite direction aside from you. And so, as I've said before, your numbers just don't add up. And in fact, you've marginalized them by characterizing the increase as a mere penny. 
Minister, your tax creates one of the highest. Uh, order. Cuts both ways. Please finish. I know it's tough having them here and be reminded. Please finish. Please finish. Minister, your tax creates one of the highest fuel taxes in North America, and that means higher ticket prices for travellers, families, and business people. It means, Minister, another 400,000 travellers diverted from Ontario airports on top of the 3 million that already crossed the border to fly from aviation fuel tax-free airports like Buffalo. We've seen the headlines, Minister. Buffalo Airport will take advantage of your increases, putting on a full-court press courting travellers as well as airlines south of the border. Sunwings, just the wingtip of the iceberg. So, Minister, you have no economic analysis. So, will you please Thank join you. us? Heed our call to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I stand, you sit. Minister Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the marketing manager in Buffalo Airport called Ontario's fuel increase insignificant compared to the federal taxes and surcharges that's being charged now. Ah. Pearson has actually indicated that it will continue to grow regardless of the issues that we put forward. And the member opposite should know this. An average ticket price domestically to Vancouver from Toronto is about $284 of which $5.90 goes to the province of Ontario. How much goes to the federal government? $52, Mr. Speaker. An international flight to Orlando, $4 goes to the province, $44 goes to the federal government, and $34 goes to the U.S. government authorities. You should be fighting for Ontario. You should be tell your cousin to, to stand up for Ontario, give more of that money back to us, so we can invest. Thank you. You see it, please? You see it, please? New question, the member from Parkdale Heights. The, uh, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, in the middle of my sentence, will now be warned. And the member from North, uh, South, Simcoe North, Door. The member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. We now know uh, the government only got two bidders for the Eglinton Crosstown Pro Public Private Partnership. Just, Mr. Speaker, two. With only two giant consortia bidding, taxpayers are going to pay more. That's inevitable. In fact, last year, the Construction and Design Alliance of Ontario said the government was about to overpay by half a billion dollars for the Eglinton Crosstown P3 alone. These same warnings came from ATU 113, Amalgamated Transit Union, the TTC, and experts in the American Public Transit Association as well. So with the contract about to be signed, how much, in fact, will the government overpay for the Eglinton Crosstown mega contract? Thank you, Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Parkdale High Park for that question. You know, the Eglinton Crosstown LRT project is, uh, Speaker, is one of the most exciting projects that our government has in our lineup. As the member there knows, uh, there is already work that's underway. Speaker, it's important to put this project in terms of its scope and its importance in context. The Eglinton Crosstown LRT will run about 19 kilometres through, uh, through Midtown Toronto, 25 stations and stops. The province of Ontario, because of the leadership of our Premier and this government, is investing $5.3 billion in this project, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, this means that the Eglinton Crosstown LRT is the largest public transit project in more than half a century here in the province of Ontario. Yeah, yeah. And that work is taking place in communities represented by people like my parliamentary assistant, uh, the member from Eglinton Lawrence, our new member from Davenport. Yes, sir. It's going to provide positive results because of the leadership that we are showing on this side and the importance that we understand or that we assign to building Ontario up. Thanks, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
So with public-private partnerships, the public is kept in the dark, as the minister knows, while the important decisions are actually made. We don't find out about surprises like a half-billion-dollar overrun in costs or dirty diesel trains until it's way too late. We know the plans for the Eglinton Crosstown have changed. There's no question about that. Kennedy Station might need to be moved, and there will be complicated conversations and connections with TTC bus and subway lines and TTC itself. We we don't know if expensive change orders will be needed. The public is completely in the dark, Mr. Speaker. Instead of negotiating the final plans for Eglinton behind closed doors with private contractors, will the government publicly disclose the contract requirements so we can Question. know exactly what we are paying billions for? Thank you. Minister Transportation. Well, Speaker, I think it's important for me to say, and this is being said by the Premier, it's being said by others on this side of the House. This is uh, in keeping, Speaker, with the unfortunate mythology that this member and that caucus continues to spin about how our government moves forward with import important transit and transportation infrastructure. The member speaks about the impact this is having on people and whether they know transparently about what's happening. Speaker, in fact, my own in-laws live a stone's throw away from where this Eglinton Crosstown LRT will be built in the neighborhood of Dufferin and Eglinton. When I see them on a regular basis, they are excited. They are thrilled because a part of their neighborhood will be built up over the next number of years, Speaker. That's, that's the kind of transparency that we're delivering. That's the kind of positive results that we're delivering. And Speaker, it's important to note that over the last number of months, at every opportunity when our government has provided a plan to the people, be it in the budget, in an election platform, yes, or in the second version of the budget, that member and that party have voted to stop public transit investments, you. and that, Speaker, is a shame. No question. Member from Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, last month you announced some significant changes to the Ontario Building Code. Taking effect on January 1, 2015, Ontario will now allow the maximum height of wood frame buildings to be increased from four to six building stories. While new to Ontario, mid-rise wood construction is common in parts of Europe, such as Scandinavia, Austria and Italy. British Columbia introduced amendments to its building code in 2009 to lightweight wood frame construction for residential occupancy, and now over 100 mid-rise wood buildings are currently built or in construction in BC. Minister, although mid-rise wood might be permitted in other jurisdictions, Question. Ontarians need to know these changes are right fit for our economy. Speaker, can the minister explain how mid-rise wood construction will Thank impact you. Ontarians? Well, I sure can, Mr. Speaker, and I'd be delighted to do so. I want to thank the uh, member from Cambridge for that question. Allowing mid-rise uh, wood construction will encourage the building of, of affordable housing across the province. As Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, I know this is incredibly important. In fact, some people in the building industry say it could lower the cost of some, uh, some uh, houses as much as 30 percent. Absolutely true. These changes will also give builders more choice in how buildings are designed, filling a gap in the housing market between high and low-rise buildings and that will certainly enhance our street, streetscapes. The change will also help strengthen the forestry sector, which creates thousands of jobs and sustains the local economies of more than 260 uh, communities across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, mid-rise mid -rise wood construction is just one way that our government is working to build Ontario up. It's beautiful. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, in my riding of Cambridge, three-story buildings on Main Street and Galt were initially built from wood in the mid-1850s. After a devastating fire in the mid-1850s, these buildings were rebuilt in stone. Speaker, Speaker, there is some concern regarding the safety of six-story wood frame buildings. Many wonder about an increased risk of building fires and whether occupants and firefighters' well-being will be compromised as a result. In addition, Ontario is moving ahead on its own mid-rise wood amendments before similar amendments are made to, the, to model the National Building Code. As with any impactful province-wide change of this nature, Ontarians need to know the considerations that public safety are paramount. 
So, Speaker, through you, can the minister explain what safety? The member from ha the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Please finish. Thank you. Speaker, through you, can the minister please explain what safety measures have been incorporated into these amendments into the building code? Sure. Well, that's a good and fair question, and it deserves a good and fair answer. Terrific Thank question. you. Uh, Speaker, safety is always our number one priority when considering changes to the building code. Our choice to allow mid-rise wood construction is based on extensive public consultation with the fire service, building regulators, and building professionals. We believe our Made in Ontario model for mid-rise wood offers the highest degree of public and firefighter safety in Canada. For example, all mid-rise wood buildings in Ontario must have stairwells and roofs built with non-combustible materials. Exactly. Mr. Speaker, Ontario requires all new construction to meet very high safety standards, especially with respect to fire safety, and mid-rise will be no different. Lastly, I'd like to thank a couple of colleagues, the Honourable Member from Thunder Bay, Ada Koken, who first introduced a, a private member's bill, and he yes, was capably assisted by his Honourable colleague from Thunder Bay, uh, the member for Thunder Bay Superior. Thank you. Hey, hey, very nice. Good question. The member from Holland and Norfolk. Speaker, to the Minister of Agriculture, today is the one-year anniversary of the Local Food Act, but you chose to proclaim this legislation in sections and play politics with it for election purposes. We shamed you into finally proclaiming the section for increased access to local food through the tax credit for farmers, farmers who donate to community food programs, food banks, and uh, other churches, other groups like that. And that was an amendment based on five years' work by our colleague, the member from Sarnia Left. Good work, Bob. But you still haven't proclaimed other parts of the bill. You speak of being open and transparent, but today you should be publishing your first annual report on local food in Ontario. Minister, today is your opportunity to be open and transparent. Why are you saying one thing and Question. not doing another? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That question is a bit rich from that member. When it came to developing the Local Food Act, we took the opportunity to reach around to all sides of this House to get to get particular piece of legislation that is profoundly changing the agricultural sector in the province of Ontario. You know, we've introduced the sale. We've introduced the sale of VQA wines at farmers markets in the province of Ontario. Since May, the sales of those VQA wines are a quarter of a billion dollars, contribute again to the great success of the Local Food Act right across the province of Ontario. But the facts are, Mr. Speaker, on numerous occasions, I've gone out of my way to recognize the member from Sardia Lampton. When we did the announcement, and, sir. When we did the announcement in Hamilton, I made sure that the member from Sardia Lampton was up front with me and gave him a chance to speak to that Thank gathering you. that day. And he knows that. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Speaker, it's, it's a little baffling. It's been a year. There's no data. Uh, one of the provisions of the Local Food Act was to publish goals and targets. Minister, you've had a bit of a rocky start, obviously, with farmers and food banks and the needy who would truly benefit from this kind of legislation. Again, talk about being open and transparent this is a prime example of how you aren't and how you fail to live up to your own legislation. We all voted for it. Your Premier boasts of being a champion for local food, yet years later, I ask, why do we still not see local food in our schools, in our hospitals, and other government institutions? Why? Why are you holding back? Why is that should have not been proclaimed? Good question. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Local Food Act has been an overwhelming success of the province of Ontario. Everywhere I go, the opportunity in north, south, east, west, I visit for farmers and they continually talk about the success of the Local Food Act. Uh, just this morning, uh, perhaps the member from Holloman Norfolk was a bit late. 
when he came to the egg farmers of Ontario's omelet breakfast this morning. But again, during my remarks, I paid tribute to the member from Sardia Lambton, the gentleman that developed the, the tax credit for donations that are made by farmers to food banks in the province of Ontario. That's the way we operate on this side of the House. We recognize people who make contributions to the agricultural sector of the province of Ontario, and I don't share the members' assertions at all on the Local Food Act. Thank you. The member from Kenora, Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker, to the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister, you met. Order. Start over. Start over. Uh, to the Minister of Natural Resources. Minister, you met with the Rainy River District delegation that travelled to Queen's Park to ask you and the Premier for your government's help with ensuring the mill in their town resumes operation. They have asked for your help. Deputy House Leader. And as Minister, that is you have a responsibility to the people of Fort Francis. You can't leave this to the two companies to solve. As Minister, you need to involve yourself and your ministry in helping to broker a solution. You know as well as I do that there is more than enough wood in the Crossroot Forest to be able to meet the needs of all parties, and therefore this should be a win-win situation. Minister, the Rainy River District and I are asking you to do your job and help broker a solution that creates jobs in Atacokan, Ignace, and Thunder Bay and saves the 1,000 jobs in Fort Francis. Question. Minister, will you do that? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, thank you, and I thank the member for the question. Speaker, she is right. We did meet uh, with the delegation, both the Minister of Northern Development and Mines and myself, uh, and I would describe the meeting as productive and uh, conducive to trying to see what we can do to move the process forward. Uh, what I would say, too, is to offer my strength of support specifically to Roy Avis, uh, the mayor of Kenora, or sorry, of Fort Francis, who, uh, in my opinion, Speaker, is a true gentleman and who I think is one of the best mayors that we have right across Northern Ontario. I've had opportunities to work with Roy previously, Mayor Avis previously on other files. I very much respect the position that he feels that he's in. I very much respect the position that the community of Fort Francis feels that they are in themselves as a broader community. I understand their fear. I understand their anxiety, and as I've said in this House over the course of the last several days, I'm committed and have still been and never stopped trying to work forward to try and find a solution, not only for Fort Francis, but for the broader community of northwestern Ontario. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Minister, it's, it's reassuring to hear that we have your support, but what we really need is your action. As minister, you have a responsibility to the people of Fort Francis. The mayor of Fort Francis and First Nations chiefs from across the Rainy River District came here this week to meet with you and ask you to act. They came 1,800 kilometres after the business deal fell apart because this is a government-related problem having to do with the forest licence. Minister, the clock is ticking. I ask you again. Will you find a solution that benefits the people living in communities across the Northwest? Thank you, Minister. Speaker, in my first response, I referenced that I very uh, personally can understand and uh, be attenuated to the feelings that are in the community of Fort Francis. In 2005, when the forest industry first started to go through this economic cataclysm, I think it's fair to describe it as, my home community of Thunder Bay was very much affected. There were multiple sawmills and multiple pulp and paper mills that closed that had been there and serviced our community for generations. So I very much respect what is going on in Fort Francis. As I've said repeatedly in the House, we are looking to try and find a solution. I would respectfully suggest also the solutions that have been for put forward uh, at this point by the third party are not necessarily things that I think can work. We are open to all options. We're open to all good ideas, but we need to understand there are other forestry operators working right across the province of Ontario who will very closely be paying attention Answer. to what we do in response to this particular situation. Here, here. Here, here. Thank, Thank you. you. New question, the member from the Tropical North. Merci. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Honourable Kevin Clinton. The Committee on General Government met earlier this week for clause by clause consideration of an important piece of legislation Bill 18, the Stronger Workplaces for a Stronger Economy Act. Speaker, with your permission, I'd like to commend the third party, as I often do, for joining with the government in putting forward important, enhancing and substantive amendments, which ultimately strive to capture the many lessons learned during our consultations with the public and stakeholders. But regrettably, Speaker, the official opposition resorted to procedural games 
filibusters and delaying tactics in an obvious attempt to derail the proceedings. Shame. They introduced Shame. hundreds, Speaker, hundreds of repetitive, meaningless amendments in order to tie up the proceedings. These disruptive efforts, I'm pleased to say, were met with sheer determination on our government side. Speaker, the committee has completed its work. Third reading debate has been completed. So can we get on with this bill? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for, uh, for his important and very timely question on this bill. I want to begin by thanking the majority of the members of the General Committee for the hard work, for the contributions, and the advocacy they've had for workers in the development of this bill, and especially the chair, the member from Glencarry, Prescott and Russell, for the excellent work he did the other night. Passing this bill is about protecting workers in this province. We can't afford it to delay it any further than these tactics already have. One of the main features of the bill is changes to the minimum wage that are based on the Consumer Price Index. It's going to provide certainty to workers, certainty to business, and they're able to plan for any changes in the future to the minimum wage. Speaker, in order for this bill to come into effect in time for next year for workers in the province of Ontario, Answer. this bill needs to pass through the legislature in a very short period of time. I'm hoping all members will support it today. Thank you, Speaker. As my colleague from Trinity Spadina reminds me, he's a, uh, actually endured 400 filibuster-type amendments. So we have to commend, I think, the government side for that. Speaker, the workers of Ontario, I think, appreciate our overall efforts. On their collective behalf, I think it's clear that we can, should, and must vote in favour of Bill 18 today particularly if our intention is to tie the minimum wage to inflation. And of course, Speaker, organizationally, this has to be implemented soon in time for next year. Mm. Minister, Bill 18 will be brought back to the House, I think momentarily, for a third and final reading before it's voted upon. If passed, promises to make stronger protections for thousands of workers across the province will, of course, emanate from this, this new law. Speaker, I'd like to know Question. what can I report back to the people of the Great Riding of Etobicoke North with regard to Bill 18? Here, here. Thank you. Minister Labour. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you for the excellent supplementary. Speaker, the member is absolutely correct. It's been nearly a year and many, many hours of debate since we first proposed the Stronger Workplaces for Stronger Econ Economy Act, which will, if passed, it takes very important steps to ensure that every Ontarian in this province gets the paycheck they've earned at the end of the day. It protects vulnerable workers from dangerous working situations, and it makes our businesses more competitive, Speaker, and it ensures they treat their workers fairly. It ties annual changes in the minimum wage to inflation. We need to net pass it now in order for this to take effect in 2015, Speaker. Speaker, this morning members will have a chance to vote on this important piece of legislation mm -hmm. in third reading. I would urge all members of the House to continue their support of this bill at third reading, just as we did unanimously as a group yes, at sir. second reading, Speaker. I urge that support. Thank, Thank you. you. New a member from Chatham, Kenny Essex. Thank you, Speaker. My, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister, the Leamington District Memorial Hospital Board of Directors is being forced to close Leamington's obstetric units due to a lack of funding. This closure will result in the firing of up to 40 good-paying jobs, including registered nurses. Keep in mind, Minister, Leamington is still reeling from the massive job losses that hit this community earlier this year. This places Leamington's economic recovery in jeopardy, but more importantly, it puts the health of local residents Sad. in jeopardy. Mothers going into labor will now be forced to make the long drive to Windsor. With millions of dollars spent on middle management in health care, why is there no room for Leamington's vital clinic? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm happy to speak to this issue again. And, uh, and I do understand that Leamington District Hospital, that the board has made this uh, difficult decision to, on a go-forward basis, the recommendation to close the obstetrics uh, unit, or at least certainly certain elements of it, that being the uh, birthing of, of children. Uh, many aspects of the Leamington obstetrics program, uh, gynecological program, the board has considered and will wish to retain. Uh, the next stage of this process, as it should be, Mr. Speaker, is that the local health integration network of that region uh, be involved. 
They are involved, Mr. Mr. Speaker. My office has been in regular contact with them. There is, as I mentioned earlier, a public meeting next Wednesday to give the opportunity for the public to be heard on this important issue to the people of Leamington. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you. Back to the minister. Uh, the sustainability of health care in rural communities has to be looked at through a different lens. Minister, I understand that LDMH has in fact submitted a proposal that would incorporate midwife and OBGYN programs that have already been acknowledged as a unique and viable program. However, the Erie St. Clair Lynn has not provided the support needed to move funding of the program forward. This Lynn has cut $2 million in funding to LDMH. Health system funding reform is closing rural hospitals. Your ministry is putting mothers and families at risk by not providing this funding in order to keep obstetrics in rural hospitals. And by the way, Minister, LDMH uh, has provided excellent health care in the community since 1956. My question to you is, why has this government question. broken its promise to make its decisions through a municipal lens? Thank you. <laughs> Minister. Well, Thank you again, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I think the member opposite needs to talk to his colleague from Bruce Gray Owen Sound to see what we are doing with our rural hospitals. I was with him a number of weeks ago in Markdale announcing that the government will be building, constructing a brand new Markdale hospital in that small rural environment, Mr. Speaker. So the truth is the opposite of what the member is trying to portray. With respect to Leamington Hospital, Mr. Speaker, the services that will be retained, in fact, the board of the hospital's argument for closing obstetrics was partly because the, uh, the volume of deliveries isn't sufficient to, uh, to uh, maintain uh, the effectiveness of that unit. Roughly half of the uh, women in Leamington currently are choosing to deliver in Windsor Regional Hospital uh, in Windsor, Mr. Speaker. But the gynecological services will re be retained. The pre- and post-care services as well be re retained. Uh, in fact, they're adding beds. The proposal is to add beds at, at uh, Leamington Hospital in acute care and other aspects to more accommodate the needs of the region, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Uh, thank you to the Deputy Premier Speaker. A private company is trying to cut a deal with the Hamilton Port Authority to build a waste gasification plant on Hamilton's waterfront. Residents are very deeply concerned, Speaker. This plant will use immature technology that so far exists only as demonstration projects. With no track record, we don't know the environmental impact and what it will be at full scale. Will this government commit to a full environmental assessment on this proposal so that we can understand how it may affect our environment? Thank you, Minister. The Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The environmental assessment process is determined independently by. Uh, scientists and experts in the Ministry of the Environment. I don't think we want to politicize that process. Uh, the member, I think, opposite knows uh, that uh, uh uh, how that process works. Uh, I'm happy to meet with her, uh, certainly one-on-one, -on -one to get a, a bit of a briefing from her on what her concerns are. We will be very responsive. We want to make sure uh, that the people in Hamilton are, uh, are, uh, have higher quality, high water quality, and any business activity on the waterfront is consistent uh, with protecting the environment, protecting the people of Hamilton. And I just want to commend the Hamilton Port Authority. Just in the last couple of years, they've added 12 new businesses, and Hamilton Port has now emerged as one of the largest ports for food and uh, yes, fruit production and transmission. Uh, and coming out of the recession, this is one of the, been the largest job creators in Hamilton, and we're very proud of that, and Thank I'm you. sure the member opposite is as well. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, Hamilton's air shed is already overburdened with pollutants. Now the government seems poised to allow a new, unproven technology that relies on waste as a fuel to contribute further to the pollutants in Hamilton's air. Children and families deserve to breathe clean air, Speaker, and it's up to this government to make sure that the quality of air and the people of Hamilton are being protected. So while I will ask one more time, will this minister commit to a full environmental assessment to protect the air and the people of my community? Uh, as the member opposite knows, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, that, that you could not open this plant without an environmental assessment. And yeah. so, yes, of course, there'll be an 
environmental assessment. I don't think we want to politicize these processes. I, I don't think any of us in this House are an expert on this particular technology. The member opposite has said it's a new technology. It will be evaluated properly, uh, and we will ensure we have about the highest standards in North America right now on environmental protection. We're very proud of that. That's the legacy of this government, and quite frankly, her party in power as well, Mr. Speaker. So, we, we, you know, th this is the government here, Mr. Speaker, that closed all the coal plants that has seen the largest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we are. We, are, we have been leading North America yes, in almost every area of environmental protection, and we have no intention to back off our record on that, Mr. Speaker, and we we'll take you. this very seriously. Your question, the member from Durham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Minister, Ontario's nuclear facilities currently provide approximately 50 per cent of electricity used by Ontarians and a number of other reactors are coming to the end of their life cycle. I am aware that our government intends on upgrading our Darlington and Bruce nuclear facilities so that they continue to provide the province with reliable, safe, and emission-free power. Yes. Minister, last week you tore the Ontario Power Generation, OPG, Darlington Nuclear Generating Station in my riding of Durham. The upgrade of the Darlington reactor is particularly important to me as it represents a significant investment for the province, as well as a very large number of people, it will Question. be creating jobs for an riding. Minister, could you please inform the House as to the status of the Darlington nuclear refurbishment? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I thank the member from Durham for raising this important question, particularly for his question. riding. Our government has put forward a long-term energy plan which includes refurbishing the nuclear reactors at Darlington and Bruce generating stations to ensure that we get the best value out of our existing infrastructure, Mr. Speaker. The refurbishment of Darlington will allow continued operation until 2055 at approximately 50 per cent of the cost of building new nuclear. That's and OPG wow. is ensuring maximum efficiency in the Dar Darlington refurbishment by allowing workers to train on a state-of-the-art training facility, including a full-scale training reactor. Correct. Nuclear Correct. refurbishment will begin in 2016, and the planned upgrades will create almost 25,000 jobs and generate $5 billion annually in economic activity. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the Minister for ensuring that our government is taking a significant step to ensure refurbishment, refurbishment in Darlington is done right. While OPG's Darlington Generating Station is one of the top performing nuclear stations in the, in the world, it is still reassuring to hear that OPG will be subject to strict oversight to ensure safety, reliable supply, and value for ratepayers. During your tour last week, you stated that the government will hold OPG accountable and that we are committed to having refurbishment happen on time and on budget. Minister, could you please inform the House as to what other measures our government has in place to protect Ontario's ratepayers from cost overruns and to ensure the project move forward on budget on time? Question. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Good Speaker, question. we have full confidence that the project will hit its targets, and the refurbishment schedule is spread out to ensure that further refurbishments will only proceed after the successful completion of the first unit. Our plan has built appropriate off-ramps should operators be unable to deliver the projects on schedule and on budget. We've been very clear that we will not proceed if there are significant costs or schedule overruns. The province has an independent oversight advisor to monitor progress and spending at each stage of the development. Our nuclear refurbishment contracts ensure that operators and contractors are accountable for refurbishment costs and schedules. A nuclear refurbishment will ensure we have safe, reliable, affordable, emissions-free energy Answer. where and when we need it. Mr. Speaker, Our Ontario like has an unblemished record of 40 years in nuclear power. We're among the safest in the Thank world, you. Mr. Speaker, and we have a tremendous supply chain. Thank you. New question, the member from Huron, Bruce. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. 
My question today is for the Minister responsible for the Poverty Reduction Strategy. On November 1st, Ontarians once again saw an increase of 3.7% on their energy bills. Today, social housing assistance for energy costs is based on 1997 prices. This scale no longer reflects Deputy the House realities Leader, associated with warm. the Liberal failed Green Energy Act and a decade of Liberal mismanagement. Stakeholders such as the Municipal Social Service Association are asking your Liberal government for a more realistic utility scale, but to date have met with no success. Minister, can you commit to including in your strategy an updated utility scale for social housing, and more importantly, when will you get this done? Thank you. Well, Speaker, I am, for poverty reduction. Thank you. I am delighted to be asked a question about the poverty reduction strategy, Speaker, because I have to say this may be the first time. So thank you for asking about the strategy. And I am hopeful that the question demonstrates a new focus from the uh, opposition party that reducing poverty actually does matter because you know the history is not so good they voted against the ontario child benefit they uh, they voted against all of the progressive initiatives including most recently in this budget speaker so we continue to increase the ontario child benefit our new poverty reduction strategy sets a very ambitious but achievable goal of ending chronic homelessness speaker and if i can now move forward with the confidence so i have the support of the opposition on here, i will be very 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 pleased thank you supplementary we need achievable outcomes today because people are going without heat. Minister, there's no excuse for turning a blind eye to today's problems that you know are hurting hardworking families across Ontario. Energy prices are going to continue to skyrocket. I'm currently hearing of residents who are using food banks so that they Mr. can Coulter save their scarce to dollars to pay their utility bills. People are selling their homes because they can no longer afford to stay in them. The United Way in my area announced last week that you, the utility assistance funding in 2014 is already dried up and waiting lists are running long. We don't even have an inch of snow yet, Minister. So today, will you do the right thing, do the honourable thing, and commit right here, right now, to resolve this shortfall before winter is here to stay? Do something today. Well, again, again, Speaker, I am delighted to see this abrupt change in tone because the PC party actually, when they were in office, slashed social assistance by 22 percent, Speaker. They they froze social assistance benefits. They ended construction of social housing. They cut all funding for affordable housing. They even cancelled uh, construction of units being built. Speaker, and I, uh, I happen to know that there are people here that need to sit for a vote. Uh, the member, the minister responsible for seniors, has done it again, and I won't tolerate it. You're warned. During the past election, they, uh, they had a plan to slash social services uh, that the most vulnerable people uh, in Answer. this province depend on. And, Speaker, in our budget that they voted against, we actually included in that budget that you voted against implementing a support program Thank you. for low to modest income families that would provide. Thank you. The member from Halliburton, Portha Lakes, Brock, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, yesterday, the Professional Engineers of Ontario were here, and they award uh, annually a member of each caucus for their hard work. And I just wanted to acknowledge the member from York Simcoe, Simcoe that received the award, the member from Kitchener Waterloo that received the award, and the Minister of um, Community, Community, and Community and Social Services that received the awards last week. Member from Hamilton Mountain on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one of my guests uh, joined us since the beginning when the formal uh, introductions happened, so I'd like to uh, welcome Frank Maselli to uh, Queen's Park today. Thank you. Before we proceed, I'd like to give you some sad news that our pages are experiencing their last day today. I want to thank them for all the good hard work that they've done.
we have a deferred vote on the motion of third reading of Bill 18, an act to amend various statutes with respect to employment and labour. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Would the members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. Minister. On November the 5th, Mr. Flynn moved third reading of Bill 18. All those in favour, please rise one at a time to be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. 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 Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Kowala. Ms. Kowala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Hartman. Mr. Hartman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Yakubuski. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pedapiece. Mr. Pedapiece. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. 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 Mr.
On October 22nd, Ms. Sandals moves second reading of Bill 10. All those in favour, please rise one at a time, be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Ms. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassen. Ms. Jassen. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Chubisson. Mr. Chubisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Denova. Ms. Denova. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Chimino. Mr. Chimino. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettit. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. The ayes are 74, the nays are 22. The ayes being 74 and the nays being 22, I declare the motion carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture de projet de loi. Pursuant <laughs> to the order of the House dated November 5th, this bill is ordered referred to the Standing Committee on Social Policy. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.